So, um, Dr. Raji, you requested me to take this topic also because this is a very important topic, right, Aldo? Slide down. Yeah. So, this is a complex regional pain syndrome, a very common syndrome which we encounter in our practice. And uh, this is like a typical patient who would come to you. Uh, in, the, in the 70s, these patients used to go to the rheumatologist because they had swollen uh, fingers, traffic changes, not being able to move their fingers, and the GP was, used to send them to a rheumatologist thinking that it is a rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a typical patient complaining of severe wrist pain. He had a cast because of a radial fracture. And after removal of the cast, patient is complaining of burning pain, numbness, tingling, and you can see dark, swollen, uh, finger, the inability to, re you can see that uh, the subtle uh, change in the color of this, um, color of the hand, this is darkish, this is pinkish, and you can see the swollen finger, traffic changes, etc. So this is a classical uh, CRPS, this is an acute phase of CRPS, this is a chronic change, this is the stage 3, where the traffic changes have already set in. And again in the lower limb, it's an acute phase of CRPS. This can follow any trivial trauma also, an ankle sprain, patient may develop a CRPS or simple fracture, two, three weeks of plaster and patient comes out with a, with a this. Why is it called complex regional pain syndrome? Because it's a very complex pain, varied and dynamic clinical presentation. Regional, because it's a non-dermatomal distribution of pain, not in that dermatome where the pain occurs. Pain is out of proportion. It's a very trivial injury. Some friend holding the hand and twisting the arm results in CRPS. Uh, and the pain and uh, the syndrome because it's a constellation of sim symptoms. The constellation of symptoms are like pain, sensory, autonomic, motor, or traffic symptoms, which can no longer be explained. A trivial trauma, like you have just hurt your wrist and developing this. Paul Sudek, we used to call it a pseudic dystrophy. When I joined my MBBS, we used to call it a pseudic dystrophy. And pseudic was the one who, in 19th century, defined the signs and symptoms of reflex sympathetic dystrophy. He used to call it RSD or pseudic dystrophy, where there was an exaggerated inflammatory response, and then, of course, there was a osteopenia, osteoporosis, and all the associated signs and symptoms of dystrophic changes. The term CRPS came when this International Association of Study of Pain came, and they, they found there are two types of CRPS. CRPS type 1, with no nerve lesions, no nerve injuries, and CRPS type 2, where there is a nerve injury. And at neurosurgeons, you see a lot of patients with brachial plexus injuries, cosalvias, nerve, peripheral nerve injuries because of trauma. These are all patients who have developed CRPS type 2. So type 1 initially is a warm, primarily warm, as you saw, pinkish and edema. That's a warm phase. And then it goes into the cold phase. So you should not allow the patient to go into the cold phase. The diagnosis should be the, at the earliest, and the treatment should start immediately. This is one patient which was sort of referred to me a long time ago in AIMS only from a neurosurgery department. He had a brachial plexus injury. He had a very severe allodynia that he had to always cover the arm for the, the hand with a cloth and he used to keep pouring it. So that sort of a burning sensation he used to get. The, he had a history of trauma. The brachial plexus was injured. There were no um, motor movements, but the pain was really exhausting for him and very severe. So, as I mentioned, acute bone phase and cold phase, and this, this is the diagnostic criteria. They should have at least one symptom out of this sensory pseudomotor, motor atrophic, and at least one sign like allodynia or temperature differences, so you can measure the temperature, uh, or there should be motor like decreased range of motion. So, these are some of the self-reported reported symptoms, and these are signs which are observed on examination. If the score is 16, this is a patient who has Complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, how to diagnose? Basically, you can rule out, the, like I said, rheumatology. So you can rule out by doing ESR, CRP to see. Initially, yes, in the warm phase, all these would be elevated. Anti-nuclear antibodies are a factor to rule out an rheumatological uh, disease. And then the confirmatory test is a triphasic bone scan or X-ray. X-ray will show you localized uh, osteoporosis. This is very significant osteoporosis, and a bone scan, triphasic bone scan, will show you the pooling of pooling of the dye in the third phase of the bone scan, and this is confirmatory. Any person with nuclear medicine experience will tell you that this is a typical sign, typical bone scan of a patient who has CRPS type two. 
Of course, you have infrared thermography. If you have this apparatus, you can take the temperature and you will see the difference between a normal and an abnormal hand. Again, confirming that this is complex regional pain syndrome. So the pathophysiology, whenever there is an insult like trauma, surgery, stroke, there is a classical inflammation, exaggerated inflammation. Then there is a neurogenic inflammation. That's why patient complains of burning sensation, autonomic dysfunction. That's why it's called sympathetically mediated pain, central nervous system plasticity, psychological factors, all these contributing. So whenever you're treating CRPS, you have to take into consideration all these factors while considering the treatment for part of it. Inflammation is very important and uh, sympathetic nervous system, like when we started, uh, CRPS was like a sympathetically mediated pain and we used to be told that you go and give a sympathetic block, patient will be better. But sooner or later we realized that it is not entirely the sympathetically mediated pain, only 50% is sympathetically mediated pain. The initial terminology reflects sympathetic dystrophy also mentioned that it is a sympathetic or over activity, but later on we found that it is an inflammation which leads on to uh, this phase and 50% of patients would be having a sympathetic over activity. Multiple discrepancies uh, undermine the possibility of sympathetic nervous system as a cause, like plasma catecholamine levels are lower. Most patients do not get a significant relief with sympathetic blocks. So that's why the terminology came in sympathetically mediated pain or sympathetically independent pain. So doing a diagnostic block, if a patient gets relief, it says SMP. If he is not getting relief, it is SIP. So we have uh, various therapies, starting from medical therapies, like vasodilators, physiotherapies. In the acute phase, you can even put in steroid, like uh, methylprednisolone, succinate infusions. They can really help. Of course, psychotherapy, sympathetic nervous blocks, like stellate ganglion or lumbar sympathetic uh, blocks can also help. Pharmacological treatment generally are steroid, bisphosphonate, calcedonin, vasodilators like nifedipine, and of course gabapentinoids are also preferred because there is an element of central sensitization. What we have got good results with a intravenous long-term ketamine infusion. Bisphosphonates are very good. As you saw, there is a localized osteoporosis. So immediately, as soon as you diagnose, you start the patient on bisphosphonate, either oral or parenteral, and they really work wonders. Tricyclic antidepressant, IV lidocaine, calcitonin, very important again, gabapentin, nifedipine orally. Sympathetic blocks do work in the sympathetically mediated pain, so it should be tried. But what I want to lay emphasis is on a new therapy which is called intravenous ketamine infusion. This is a stellate ganglion block, and you can see the patient is having a Horner syndrome. Three months post modal therapy, post multimodal therapy after stellate, this patient is doing wonders. Now, ketamine infusion do, do, do have a role. And ketamine infusions, what we do is we give uh, in a dose of about one milligram per kilogram body weight and dissolve in normal saline and give it over a period of four hours. And every day we increase the dose. We give it for six to 10 days. We increase the dose by 25 to 50 milligram to go up to maximum of 300 milligram in 24 hours. And this is one, this is an NMD receptor antagonist. Unfortunately, we do not have any oral drug which can block the NMD receptors, but this works wonder to be done under monitoring, to be done in a hospital setup, but fantastic uh, desensitization because NMD receptors uh, blockade uh, happens and the desensitization can only be helped with the help of these drugs which act on the NMD receptors. Then mirror therapies are some sort of, uh, like whenever there are trophic changes, the mirror amazing graded therapy can help in mobilization of the, otherwise these trophic changes are very difficult to handle. So imagery, Mirror imaging, like patient places a normal hand in front of the mirror, a normal hand behind the mirror. He moves the, uh, the normal hand and, the, and the, with a, involuntarily the, the affected hand also starts moving. And this is a very good physiotherapeutic or rehabilitation mode. So graded motor imagery as we call it. So the carry home message is that CRPS is a constellation of pain, sensory, autonomic, motor and trophic symptoms. It is heterogeneous and a mixed pathophysiology. Some of sympathetic nervous system uh, cause is there, definitely 50%. But the combination therapy helps, which involves pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and of course, uh, therapies like intravenous ketamine and sympathetic blocks. Thank you. Thank you very much.